What's up, RLI family? Welcome to our YouTube channel. Wherever you're tuning in from, you are an answer to prayer. It is our hope that you find restoration power in your life, your family, and your household. Let's take a listen. Come on, why don't we just posture our hearts this morning and get ready to worship the Lord.
Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, cause he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. And I still got joy.
satisfies like you do the fountain Psalms 34, verses 19 through 22. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. But the Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. We have a promise right here in Scripture that we will have many afflictions, many trials, many heartaches, many difficulties, but we have a promise from God that he will deliver us out of every last one of them. There is nothing we will ever encounter. There is no suffering that will ever take place in our lives that God has not promised to deliver us out of. This is a guarantee right here in scripture. And it goes on to say that we'll come out as if nothing even happened. He says that our bones won't even be broken. And how beautiful is it that Jesus was broken on our behalf, had his body ripped apart, had his blood poured out on us on our behalf, and yet he's saying, even though you're gonna go through stuff, you're gonna come out as if nothing ever happened. And this is a promise that we have in scripture. So as we're taking communion this morning, I want us to really dwell on what this represents because we just read a promise. Jesus didn't just die so that we would go to heaven, but he died so that when he's with us, we know that we can rest. 
we know that he will see us through every trial, every difficulty, through every affliction. Again, I want you to remember what we just read, that the, the, the afflictions of the righteous are many, but he promises. It's right here. He promises to deliver us out of all of them. So as we're taking communion this morning and we're thinking about his body being ripped on our behalf, his blood being poured out on us, let's truly worship him as we're doing this. Church, let's take the body together. Church, let's take the blood together. Jesus, thank you for what you did on the cross, for what only you could do, and that despite the difficulties of life, you are with us through every last one of them. And that you give us grace, you give us mercy, you give us strength, you give us the ability to be able to get through everything. And not only that, but you promise to work all things together for our good. Jesus, we love you and we praise you. Thank you for what you did on the cross. In Jesus' precious name, we said. Good morning, church. Thank you so much for being here. Everyone that's joining us online, thank you for being with us in our online community. Please greet the person to your left, to your right, in front of you and behind you. Say hello to someone that you don't know. Good morning. We've come to a time of giving now, and uh, there are several ways to give. Uh, there will be ways that will show up here in a minute that will show you electronically how you can give. And if you're more comfortable with cash or checks, the ushers at the end of the service will have some offering plates out there that you can put your money into. There you go. There's some ways to give. Super convenient. Uh, and while you're working on that, I just wanted to share a thought with you. It's not really an offering thought, but it's kind of a perspective on money thought. I was reading uh, Revelations 21, and it talks about the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven. And the new Jerusalem is a huge, huge city with a wall around it. And the wall is made of gold and jewels and the streets are made of gold, pure, pure gold. And when I thought about that, well, the thought that came to my mind was, we put a lot of emphasis on money. Uh, just in case anyone's curious, gold goes for $1,843 an ounce right now. And if you're curious, uh, I don't know much about jewels, but I know a diamond about that big cost about $3,000. So they're very valuable, and we get caught up in things that are valuable. But from heaven's perspective, it's the stuff that they make the streets out of. It's the stuff that they make the walls out of. That's my visual, chunk of concrete. What, I don't want you to get the idea that money is unimportant. The Bible tells us we need to work, we need to make a living so we can support ourselves, our families, support our church, support ministry, and God sometimes uses money to bless his people with wealth. So it's good, money is a tool, but our culture tells us that money is a goal. Uh, when I was young, you used to see a bumper sticker that said, uh, whoever dies with the most toys wins. And that was the philosophy, money was the goal. And sometimes in going for that goal, we sacrifice things that are important. We may sacrifice relationships. We may sacrifice our families. We may sacrifice our integrity. We may forego giving to God's work because money is the goal. And those things are so much more important. What I want you to think about is 
look at money from heaven's perspective. Our relationships, our integrity, these things are important. Don't sacrifice those when it, from heaven's perspective, what you're sacrificing for is a chunk of cement. So anyways, as you give, think about what's, in, what's the real important thing. And as you live your life, it's not just giving, it's the way you live your life. Let's pray and ask God to bless this offering. Father God, we thank you for everything you give for us. You are our provider. Everything we have comes from you. We thank you that you look out for us, that you take care of us. We thank you for everything you've given us. And we ask that you will bless the offerings that we're giving, Lord, that they will bring glory to you, that they will serve your purpose, that they will bring your kingdom here sooner. And we ask that you be glorified and honored. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we're going to go ahead and see an announcement video. And then please welcome up Pastor Don. And just like that, the month of May has come to an end. But family, we are just getting started. The month of June is filled with so many opportunities of events, fellowship, and Holy Spirit moments. Yes, but first, VIP team, can you please stand up and just give a huge wave? If this is your first time here after this service, please see our VIP team. All of these smiling faces are here to pray for you, to get you all plugged in and connected to everything going on here on campus. Also, if you're joining us online, please click the connect link in the chat because we wanna connect with you too. For anyone who's new to Restoration Life and wants to make this their church home, get involved, serve on a dream team, and ingrain yourself in what God is doing here at Restoration Life, we are so excited to announce that our next DNA growth track is happening June 7th at 7 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. We are so thrilled to see what God is going to do through and in you all. So go sign up soon. But the fun doesn't just end there. Girl, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> Dream teams, listen up and mark your calendars. Wednesday, June 8th at 7 p.m. is our Dream Team Night here on campus. Crystal, I love our Dream Team Nights because it's a night where our volunteers get to come together to celebrate each other and to honor our house and those who go above and beyond. If you need more information, please reach out to your Dream Team lead. Hey church fam, Elizabeth Gonzalez here and I'm your Children's Church Director. June is such an exciting month for us here in Kids Life. We're getting ready to graduate our kids to the next class. On June 12th, we'll be honoring them and praying for them during our 1130 service. And on June 19th, they'll be in their brand new classrooms. But parents, don't worry. When you pick up your child today, we will notify you whether or not your child will be promoting up. And if you have any questions, here's my email. Parents, I look forward to celebrating our children together. Well, that sounds so amazing. Family, aren't you excited that midweeks are finally back? Services are every Wednesday at 7 p.m. starting June 15th. And man, what a difference it's going to make to come together to seek and glorify God during the middle of the week. I can't wait to see you there. You feel that? You feel that awkwardness? Mm-hmm. Kind of weird. Yeah, that's how fathers feel every year around Father's Day time. See, moms, they get everything. They get all the best things. But this year, this year, we're going to celebrate our fathers. We're going to celebrate Father's Day like never before. No more ties and no more macaroni statues. No more, hey, Dad, here's my handprints. No, no, no. We're going to turn the volume all the way up this year on Father's Day. June 19th, we're going to celebrate like we've never done before with one amazing outdoor service starting at 930. We're going to have cars. We're going to have games. We're going to have prizes. We're going to have food, worship, the word. It's going to be amazing. Fathers of Restoration Life, you have to be there. Families of fathers, you better celebrate your fathers big. You better go all in. You better go big like you do for your mama. Go big for your fathers this year. We cannot wait to have you guys there and celebrate Father's Day this year at Restoration Life. Summer is right around the corner, so young adults, get ready for our West Fest revival that's happening here on campus June 24th and 25th. So be sure to save the dates and more information will be out soon. Well, that's all the time we have for today. If you missed any of these announcements, you can always head over to our app or our website for more information. And don't forget, you can follow us on our Instagram at Restoration Life Church. 
And family, say it with us. To listen to us on the go, you can listen to us on YouTube, Spotify, or podcasts. We hope you enjoyed today's message. Well, good morning. It's always fun to do new things. I'm uh, honored to be here, honored to have you here. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord. It does seem a little different for me uh, up here and looking down at our lead pastors here, but I'm grateful to be here. Uh, it took a little work to get me here, as some of us might know. Uh, usually I'm here serving with Kids Life, and I want you to know that Kids Life, that's their service. They do the worship. They do the prayer. They do the communion. They do the offering. They do it. And so I'm so grateful that they're able to continue without my presence at the moment. And uh, I'm, I'm always looking at ways to build our, our children because really they are the future, right? Yeah. That's the future of the, of the church. So we have lots going on in the month of June, but don't let that worry you. It's all good stuff, right? We have promotions for the kids. That's exciting. That's coming up. Yep. We have Kids Life training for CPR. We want to make sure our kids are safe and, uh, you know, first aid. We have that coming up. We have Father's Day, as you just heard, so make sure you get that. And then we have Dependence Day coming in. Yeah, Dependence Day, you know. Not Independence. We're dependent on the Lord, and that's a day we get to celebrate again for Him, for us being here. So... If you have any questions, I think the simplest thing is just go online or check your app, and you'll have all that information there. Instagram. There you go. All right. So we've been in this uh, study of dunamis. Dunamis! Power. Yeah. (laughs) The power of God. And, you know, it says, I want to know Christ in Philippians 3.10. Yes, to know the power of his what? Resurrection. And participation in what? His sufferings, becoming like him in his death. So you want his power? We need to humble ourselves. We need to be like him. We need to, uh, we'll have suffering. There'll be persecution, as uh, Michael mentioned in uh, the communion. And Ron, I always, I love when you come up, and I love that little uh, demonstration But whenever we're in the book of Revelation, I love that even more. And he brought a real important uh, truth there. That in heaven, all the gold and all the jewel, all the things we do, are that's that's what heaven's made of. We're walking on that stuff. So beautiful. And we're going to get more in Revelation in a minute. Um, With the power of dunamis, we have access to the Father, as we heard. Uh, Not just his power, but his presence, his provision, Um, his uh, grace, his mercy, his healing, uh, and that's all because of Christ. All because of Christ. And then we have hope secured in Christ. Uh, That hope is uh, recognizing the fact that he paid the price for our sin, and uh, we just have to repent and come to him, and then you have an eternal hope, something the world doesn't have. They just live for the moment. And this moment is going to end sooner than later. I mean, think about it. This is the generation that saw Israel come back. Israel is a nation again. The Bible talks that Israel is a picture of the fig tree. And when it blossoms, that's when the, he'll return. This generation has witnessed that. That's never, ever happened before in history, ever. That's something to take note of. Something else you should take note of, and I, you know, I watch TV from time to time. I usually put on YouTube, and I can go there, and I watch all the webcams around the world, all the live webcams. They're not just cameras at videos. They're live webcams. And and the other day, I was watching the Wailing Wall, you know, the wall in Jerusalem. They used to have a cam that was way distance, far back. I found a camera that was close, within feet, and it would move around so you can kind of see who's there and it was beautiful to see because in the past i only see these little dots all the people that were there and this time i was able to witness uh you know the rabbis teaching individual teenagers right there right in front before they go to the wailing wall you can see them giving instruction that's discipleship and then you see them doing that movement right you ever wonder what that's for When they're reading the word, it says that the light comes into them, and this is like a flickering light. This is what the picture is. And so that's why they bob up and down. And when the the camera cams 
uh, moved to the side, I could see a division in there, and the wall is still there, and it continues, and the women were on the other way, side of that wall, and they were doing the same thing. And the only difference is that I saw women who were up at the wall, and then when they leave, they would walk back like this because they say that it's disrespectful to turn your back on the wailing wall. But I want you to know something. In this generation, and only this generation, can you do that because of technology. It's setting up for his return. And the return is sooner than later. I just want you to know that. Because I want to give you a warning here. And the warning is this. You know when you watch TV sometimes and you get those commercials and they give you all those medications and they say, you know, it's all this good stuff, but then all of a sudden they talk real fast and the print gets really small and you can't even read it. And before you know it, they say, call your doctor and, and ask for it. It's good stuff. It's like, really? I'm not calling for that. Doesn't even make sense. So here's the warning for today. Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the what? Power. The power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Look, you're sitting here in this service. We never just come to service or any conference or any meeting just to come. We come because we want to be transformed. We want to be renewed. We want to be changed. And this, the power of God that can do that. And he does that when he's in us. And so we need to recognize that fact. And that's my prayer for us today, is that we don't just reach up because we don't really reach up. That's all the other religions works. I'm going to God. No, God came to us in the form of Jesus Christ. We want him to reach in. Reach in. Let's pray. Father, you are so good. You are so holy, amazing, incredible. We are so thankful. We want more of you and less of us. And so, Lord, open our ears to hear and our hearts Soften so that we may receive the word that is about to come before us. We thank you in your precious name, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we all say? Amen. I want you to know the message that's here, as always, has already been prepared. It's in the Bible. Everything we get is in it's God's word. He's already prepared the meal. I'm simply the server, and I'm going to serve it to you, and hopefully you can receive it. That's all it is. It's like one big restaurant, and we're going to enjoy some food here for our spirits. So we're going to be in the book of Revelation. You can open up your Bible, open up your apps, pull out your phone. However you receive the word, uh, that would be the time to do it now. And we're going to be in ch uh, Revelation chapter 3, 14 through 22. I, I titled this, uh, you know, still going along the lines of dunamis, but the dunamis of his table, the power of his table. This is what we're going to talk about. And so before we get into this particular church uh, called Laodicea, this church uh, is one of seven that John uh, was dictating that Jesus told him while he was on an island called Patmos, all alone. Uh, consider it like prison. Some of the best things come out of prison, isn't it? I mean, think about it. Paul's writing, same thing. So when, when he was getting this, God came to him because he knew he would do it. He'll come to you if he knows you'll do it. If he has something he wants you to do, he's going to come to you because he knows not only you'll do it, but you can do it. So don't be afraid to step out when he steps in, yeah. right? So John writes these letters based off what Jesus is telling him, and he writes it to seven churches. And so just to kind of get an idea, I've been studying Revelation for probably about the last 10 to 12 years, and... Um, I have a, a, an online class now, uh, was originally in person. We were up to about 30 or so. We're up to about 80. Now, not all of them come online at one time. It's just too chaotic. So usually it's usually about 12 to 15 that follow once a week. Um, but I do want you to know that um, I feel like I've been born for the book of Revelation. It's like to share it, right, to, to express it. Because how many of you have read it? How many of you read it all the way through? Good, good. Because some, and most people, they start it, and then the guy like, I don't understand that. And that sounds horrible. I don't want to read that. I'm going back to Genesis. It's real simple. It's clean. It's to the point. It's real fleshy. But no, uh, I love Revelation because it's the culmination of everything in the Bible. It just 
puts it right there in plain sight, and it makes it real, and it's prophetic. So parts of this is written, uh, the first chapter is really about dealing with what is, uh, has happened. You know, Jesus Christ came, he died, he crucified, and then the risen Jesus Christ. Uh, what, that's what the first chapter really describes. It's in, in symbols, but it describes Jesus Christ. That's the only description we have of him. And then the second and third chapter is right about the things that uh, are, which is the church. And so there's these seven churches at that time that were real and alive and doing certain things that Jesus said, good, well done, good and faithful servants. You're doing well, but I got this to correct with you. And then we get into the final part, which is all prophetic, which is write the things that will be. That's chapter 4. But we're in chapter 3. Keep note of that. So before we move into that, I just want to give you a little overview of this church. And it not only describes the church of that day, but it describes the church of this age, right now. Right now. This is the seventh of seven letters. If you're a historian, you can kind of see this picture of the church age. Though it describes specific churches, you can see it develop. We're looking back at it now, and we can see how the church has moved over time. And this describes the church of today. And you'll see in a minute. So Laodicea, first of all, was a main thoroughfare. It was like Hawthorne Boulevard being right there in front of if this was the church of Laodicea. And it had all the commerce, all the stores, all the banks. It was very lush, and it was rich, and it was very affluent. And this is the picture of, of the city and a picture of the church. And we'll see in a minute. Uh, the city's location uh, allowed for wool to be produced. So they, the main commodity of Laodicea was producing wool. But keep in mind, it's black wool not white wool. Keep that note, black wool. So that means their gowns were probably, a lot of them made in black. Their bedding was in black. You know, it's black wool. And here we're going to see in a minute how Jesus uses this. He's very personal with all the letters, and you can see it here. Um, this city was also uh, famous for a medical school, and it had an eye ointment. And so people from all around the world and that area would come to get this ointment so that it would help heal their eyes when they have infections or they have problems with the eye, it would help them. And so there's this uh, medical school that was famous uh, for that ointment. And then lastly, uh, this city, unlike the city of Coloss. Coloss would be like, uh, I don't know, San Bernardino, right? Uh, they have all that fresh water coming off the mountain when, when it snows and then it melts. It's cold, it's fresh, it's clean. But Laodicea wasn't near any mountains, and they had to take water from another city, and it, they had to pipe it in, and they used the hot springs. Now, I don't know if any of you have been to hot springs. You been to Glen Ivy? You been to any hot springs? They stink because <laughs> of the sulfur and the minerals. And so here we got this hot water coming from the city, and then all of a sudden it's c traveling, and by the time it gets there, it's no longer hot, but just sort of lukewarm. And that's the name of this town. And this church is being uh, reprimanded, so to speak, or corrected by Jesus, saying, you're lukewarm. And so we can see how Jesus, in all the letters again, but here we can see it as we're going through it, how personal he makes his letter to that church of that day and the day of today. And so um, it's, a, it's a beautiful picture. Uh, chapter 3, verse 14. Let's get right into it. It says, And to the angel of the church. Now, the angel of the church is usually what we reference as the pastor, the leader, the one overseeing the, the flock uh, that was um, commissioned by God. It says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. Now, every other address to all the other churches, it was to the name of the church. So in, in this case, it should have followed suit and said to the angel of the church of Laodicea. But it says to the Laodiceans. When you dissect this word, laos means laity, and diceans means uh, decisions, it appears that he's addressing the congregation because they're the ones who are really running the church and not the lead pastor. And we can see that today. 
This, this is a type of church that occurs today and was occurring back then. Not this church, but we can see it in other churches. And then it goes on to say, these things says the amen, uh, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. That's a whole in full suitcase of things to unpack there. Um, think about this. He says, I'm the amen. That means so be it, meaning I'm telling you who I am. I'm the real deal. And, and so the amen is, is writing this letter. And, and, and then the faithful and true witness. Well, we know he's faithful when we're not. And his word is true. It always comes to fruition. In fact, the word says, uh, heaven and earth will pass away. But his words won't. They hold true. That's the substance. And it also says we have a new heaven and a new earth coming. That's why they pass away. That's what we have to look forward to because of him. That's dunamis. That's power. So not only that, but then he says the beginning of the creation of God. Why would he bring that up? Well, because in that day they were questioning who created. And in this day, the big word is evolution. Who created? How did we get here? How did this happen? Is it the Big Bang or is it the Big God? What do you decide, right? So there's this questioning, and, and that's an end-time deception is, uh, is the beginning and how it all started. And so no other, no other generation has had to deal with that except us. And so he's speaking to this generation again. So, again, Jesus is identifying himself. He's laying it out on the line, and he's being pretty quick about it. In other letters, he's kind of uh, gentle and works into it. You know, I like this, what you're doing, but I don't really like this, and you need to change it. Here he's just coming right out. I am who I am. If you don't change, uh, we got some consequences. And so he's telling him, telling the church and, and those congregants. So this church... Uh, just to kind of give you an idea, um, these are like churches of today we can see. Sometimes they'll bring in celebrity interviews and they'll give their what we call testimony, but it's really this positive affirmations and positive stories oftentimes. It's not starting with uh, him, it starts with I. It's what they've done. And if, if you think it, then it'll be. And that's kind of the positiveness of, of things that are going on in the church today as well as it was then. And, and so this church uh, is not being a faithful witness, but he is the faithful witness. Um, evolution, again, is something that has only come around in the 1900s, the early 1900s, uh, and really solidified. And it's in every school now. And children, I talk to them. I have to tell you, uh, they're, they're confused as many adults. And so we need, to, we need to bring the truth. The Bible's clear when dinosaurs were made, uh, land animals, uh, all of that. It's clear. And they don't understand it until we teach them. And so that's what we do. Uh, God is a God of clarity, not, not of, of deception or not of confusion. It's clarity. So... Um, he, he brings up the fact that he was there when creation started. And the issue with that, when you think about it, is there's a number of cults out there. Uh, Jehovah Witness, uh, Mormons, they don't believe Jesus uh, is God. They believe he was a created being. And he's saying right here, I was there when created, creation started. In fact, that word that's used in this portion um, of the Bible is... Uh, he was the originator. He, he was the source. He wasn't like uh, born. He wasn't the first one born. It means Jesus has always been there, even before his birth. And we know that from other readings. Uh, Melchizedek was a picture of the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. So again, uh, Jesus has always been. He's not a born being. Although he came born as a child and grew up, that he identifies with us more likely so that we can identify with him. That's what it's about. All right, so verse uh, uh, 16, uh, 15, 16. I know your works, he says. 
He says, works that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That's pretty severe. I don't know about you when the last time you vomited, but I don't like doing it. I try to stop it. But it's poison to our bodies. It causes cramps to our bellies. And so the body rectifies that by trying to get rid of it. And that's what he's saying here. You are poison to me. I don't want anything to do with that. I'm going to vomit you out. So we know hot water is useful for boiling and cooking. Uh, we know cold water is refreshing. But lukewarm water, nobody goes and just gets lukewarm water and drinks it. It's rare. I mean, you don't even bathe in it. You, you don't even... What do you do with lukewarm water? And that's kind of the concept. And remember, in the beginning, I said the water was piped into that city. Well, that city, because of all the mineral and the content, it was gross. And so when they cooked with it, their food would be gross. And when they used it to make teas and whatever else they did, it was, they just didn't want it. They wanted to vomit it out as well. Um, so here's another picture how Jesus is using what they're dealing with uh, right here in his letter. Um, so these folks were undecisive. They're on the fence. They're wishy-washy. They got comfortable because of the affluence, not only in the city, but the church had money. It was affluent as well. This city was so rich. In, in A.D. Uh, 17, uh, there was a great big earthquake, and the whole city was demolished. And just like governments, right? The Romans, they came, the Roman government, and they said, oh, we'll help you rebuild. We'll give you a loan. We'll give you some finances. We'll give you government funding, basically. You know what they said? We don't need it. We got all the money we got, and we'll build it the way we want, and so keep it for yourselves. That's what this city did. The church sort of took on that attitude as well. We don't need anything. We're well off. We're doing just fine. They got comfortable. That's not a good place to be. Not a good place to be. Verse 17. You know, it just hit me that when he says, I'll vomit you out, there's other scripture that says to some folks that, you know, they think they're believers, they think they're saved, and when they meet him, he says, not well done and good and faithful servant. He says, I never knew you. Depart from me. It's the same idea. It's, it's throughout the whole Bible. If you believe me, you'll follow me. You'll do things. You won't just talk about it, but that you'll do something about it. It should be part of our DNA. It should be in us. And he's in us. And when he's in us, that light is in us, and so we would be shining for the world. Verse 17, it says, Because you say I'm rich, and this is the crux of it, because you say I'm rich, you have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know what you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. It reminds me of a poster I once saw when I was in chiropractic school. This, uh, you know, tall building, 40 stories tall, and there's this guy that jumps off, and you see him about halfway down, and he's going backwards on his back. He's feeling the air on his back. He's smiling and laughing. You can see his face. And the caption says, I feel great, <laughs> until he hits bottom, until he hits the ground, when he lands. And this is the case here. These folks, they don't even know that they're sinning. They're so comfortable with it. They, they don't even want to change. And so he's making them aware of this sin. And they don't even know their need for repentance or the cross. Why? Because they're not interested in repentance or the cross or suffering. They're interested in prosperity. Oh, like the prosperity gospel? Yeah, that's strictly it. They're interested in the healings. They're interested in what the Holy Spirit can give us. They're interested in the gifts and not so much the gift giver. This is the problem. Money isn't the issue. It's what we do to steward that money. That's the issue. And that comes from the inside. 
And so he's warning this church, these, the Laodicean church. Uh, you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked, yet you're rich in, in wealth. You're rich in the things that you have, the nice car, the new house, whatever it is. You, you think you're rich, but you're not. In my eyes, you're poor. Verse 18 says, I counsel you to buy from me. I love that. This is God speaking. He could have commanded it. He could have demanded it. He says, no, I'm counselor. I'm going to counsel you. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich with white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not, may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with this eye salve that you may see. Interesting. You see how it's kind of tying together here. So he says, I'm your counselor, and I'm going to give you some advice, and it's up to you to take it or not. It, God is full of grace and mercy. He's not going to force you to do something you don't want to do. He's not going to break the door down and drag you out and say, worship me. That's not who he is. This has to be love, and we have a choice, and he's given us that choice. So the truth is clear to them. They have the same word we have. The only difference is they apply it in a lukewarm fashion because they're comfortable. And if they make any changes, that means they have to become uncomfortable. And if they become uncomfortable, then they have to change their lifestyle, right? So you can see how this could be. Now, we know that gold is precious. But pure gold, how do they do that, you know? They use fire to burn off the impurities. So he's saying here, buy gold from me. In other words, let me, I'm with you, let me purify you. How? Through trials, through tribulations, through tests. How else do you know where you stand? How else do, I know when I was in college, I didn't know if I knew anything until I took a test. And I go, oh, I passed. I knew something. <laughs> it's the same thing here. So we're when we're under those tests and trials and tribulations, when you feel like you're persecuted and you're being alone, and even in your own house and alone, and you think you're just, you know, at the edge of whatever, you're depressed or whatever you're thinking, he's with you. He's with you. You don't have to feel lonely. You, you just bow down to get on the floor like the priests used to do and throw dirt on them. Humble yourselves. I think it's interesting that this month is what? Pride month. The very thing that took angels out of heaven and away from God and we're celebrating. I got to tell you, it's not just a month. It's year round. The world has become so sick. We need Jesus Christ more and more than ever. And then these white robes of righteousness. That's Jesus Christ. He's the one who gives us his righteousness. And when we have these robes, Later on in Revelation, it talks the, about the bride with clean and pure and white robes. Remember, they were producing black robes. Here, the description is white robes. And this is something Jesus fulfills. And he covers us. That's what he's saying. Let me cover you in the righteousness of me. God doesn't see us. He sees Jesus in us. That's why we can come to the Father. It's because of what Jesus has done. And then this eye salve to anoint your eyes so that you can see. He's really saying, call upon me. You don't need that salve. I'm your salve. I'll anoint your eyes. I'll open them. I'll give you vision. I'll give you clarity. I'll let you see. That's what he's saying. Trust me. And we, we can trust him because of what he's done. And, and we're, look, we're in a better position then than they were at that point right? We're looking back on everything, and we can see what Christ has done. We know all of it, and so we, we, we have no excuse not to follow him, and so if you believe Jesus is Lord and Savior, then you are rich, and you are clean, and you will be able to see. That's what he's saying, and in verse 19, it says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. So he not only does he tell us how to come back if we've become lukewarm by repenting, but he also tells us that 
he rebukes us and chastens us. I think that's important because in the Old Testament, in Proverbs, it talks about God is the one who gives chastening. God is the one who does correction. God is the one who does that. Well, then he just sort of laid out his divinity. He's divine. Jesus is God. And so when you have someone who comes and says, Jesus isn't God, you have another area in Scripture, and this is throughout Revelation, that this is seen. So Jesus is God. And so he's the one who does uh, the correcting here as well. And so he's also like a coach. How many of you have coached before? Yeah? And you know, you get like 20 or 30 kids on your team or whatever it is you're coaching. You got a group. What happens? Well, who are you going to work with? What do you think? The ones that are interested, the ones that are on fire, the ones that want to play, those are the ones you're going to work with, right? But the ones that don't and they want to be bench warmers, you know, people who sit in church every Sunday and then leave and don't receive and don't change, right? That's, that's the concept here. Bench warmers. So he's also a coach, and he's going to correct, and he's going to help, and he's going to, just like any coach, he's the one that will do it. And, and so you draw closer to him, he draws closer to you. That's the picture. Verse 20, my favorite verse of all the Bible is right here. Everyone has a favorite verse, I hope. This one's mine. But it starts off with behold, and I like that word behold. You see it throughout Scripture, many times in Revelation. It's almost as if he's saying, listen up, take hold. I got something important I'm going to share with you, so behold behold and then he goes on to say i stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door i will come into him and dine with him and he with me this letter if you recall is written to a church who professes to know jesus christ but here Jesus is outside the church, as if he's an outcast, as if he doesn't belong. And the door, like if I'm looking out these doors right here and the glass doors, can you imagine if Jesus walked up and, and we don't let him in? That's what's the picture. And so he wants us to open the door of our hearts so that he can come in and he can dine and he can refresh us, and he can change us. But, he says, if the church isn't going to listen to me, he says what? If anyone opens the door, anyone, look, the offer, the invitation, it's inclusive. It's everyone. But the faith? It's exclusive because why? Not everybody wants it. Not everybody wants to open that door. That's the same with hell. Jesus doesn't send anyone to hell. We choose to go there because we don't want to open the door. We don't want anything to do with Jesus, and so he's honoring. Fine, I'll let you go to hell. That's where you want to go. So I get this picture at the great white throne judgment, when they stand before, and again, we don't stand there. We're already saved. The only judgment we have is what crowns we have is what we're going to do in the millennium and beyond. But the great white throne judgment, I get the sense that when they stand before him, they will fall to the ground, and they're not going to be crying. They're not going to be repenting. They're not going to be wanting it. They're going to say, get me out of here. And he says, okay. It's not going to take long. He's just going to send them because that's where they want to go. They don't want anything to do with them now. Why would they want anything to do with them then? Hearts are hard. They don't want him. Verse 21. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me. <laughs> My throne. That's suggestive of the millennium because when he does return, we will sit with him and rule and reign with him during that time period. That's what this is referencing. It says, and also I 
I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. You get that picture? He's not just willing to come in and dine with you and commune with you and I. He's willing to let you sit on his throne with him. That's grace and mercy because we certainly don't deserve it. Not one of us. Little side note. You know that communion, when we do that every Sunday, and I don't know if you do it at home, I do. Periodically, I'll do it at home as well. Every time I have a gathering on Revelators, we do communion. And any other times that there's something special. I, I like to bring him into the mix. I want him to commune with that meeting. And that's the whole point. But do you know that when he resurrected, every single uh, time mentioned uh, where they encounter Jesus Christ, it's over a meal. Uh, the road to Emmaus. Those two were walking away from what took place. And then they met him, the stranger. They didn't recognize him until what? They broke a meal together. Jesus disappears. Disciples turn around. And they're heading back to Jerusalem on fire. That's power. Peter, not only did he go fishing, which he wasn't supposed to. He's supposed to be a fisher of men, not a fisherman. <laughs> But he also dragged the others with him. And then he sees them on the shoreline. He finally recognizes them. And what does Peter do? He doesn't just jump into the water. He grabs his gown, his, his smock, so to speak, and puts it on. Don't you find that odd? I don't know about you, but when I've gone in the water, I take my clothes off and go in. He puts his clothes on. I think he realized who that was. And he says, I'm not coming back. I don't have to come back to this place. I've been called. And he was restored while having fish. Jesus restores him. Thomas. Thomas didn't believe. Oh, he walked with Jesus. He knew Jesus the man. He didn't really know Jesus God. He didn't believe he resurrected. It took a meal again. Jesus walks in. Touch, feel, taste. I'm going to eat. You eat. Come on. Let's have a meal together. Communion, the meal, it always points to his table. That's what this church needs. That's what we need to sustain us, to remind us, to keep us fresh in the faith and in the word. It's so important. And then it says there's overcomers, right? He who overcomes, in verse 21, I will grant to sit on my throne. Those overcomers, that's hope. Because that means not only in that day, that church was not doing what it was supposed to do, but there were still people in that church that overcame. Just as there is today, there's overcomers. Not every church is like this one that's being described. I like to think we're in the church that God says, well done, good and faithful servants. Keep it up. You're doing what you're supposed to do. You're in the faith, you're in the word, you're communing with me, you're witnessing, and people are coming to me. This is what I want. This is what we are. This is, again, our DNA. Verse 22, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The good news there, if you have one bad ear, you still have another ear. He's given us two ears, two opportunities to hear him. Are you kidding me? That's grace. Look, Jesus is not a model. He's not a mascot. He's not our mammon maker. He doesn't make the money. It's not just about the gifts that they can give us. It's about who he is and how he, how he walks with us and how he loves us and shows us how to live. That's who he is. And then as a benefit, we don't have to be distracted by the fact that we might inherit money or we might become rich because, again, it's not money that's the root of the problem. It's how we steward that money. Those are all just benefits. Those are part of it. But we don't need to focus on it as we see some people do, like Simon the sorcerer. He was one that just wanted all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And if I can't have it, can I buy it? No. 
You can't buy those gifts. Jesus wants to be our loving master, one who takes care of us and watches over us and protects us and keeps us safe and has a relationship and allows us to eat with him in his house, at his table. That's who Jesus is. His first coming isn't about condemning or judging. It's about being saved. But his second coming, that's judgment. And I got good news for you. We're in chapter 3. Right after chapter 3 comes what? Oh, you do read your Bibles. (laughs) Chapter 4. And right off the bat, John is taken up, it says, to heaven. And he has the vision of the rest of the book of Revelation, which is all prophetic. John is a picture of the church. And that's being raptured. The church isn't in the days of judgment. The bride is not to be judged. The bride is not condemned. The bride is forgiven. The bride is loved. The bride is cherished because we cherish our groom. That's what it's about. Remember that dock on the door? He's knocking. I had a patient, older patient. He didn't start old. He came in young. And as we aged, and I've aged too, he, he was in his 90s. And he couldn't make it to the office. I said, no worry, I'm going to come to you. So once a week, I'd go spend time with him. I'd adjust him, but it was more than an adjustment. He'd make lunch for me sometimes. We would talk about things that most people would not even talk about. And one time he, he looked at me. And he knew I was at the church. and I have a role there. And he said, what's it going to be like when I die? Well, that opened up a whole opportunity. I'll see him again. And then he said, Don, I'm alone. I don't have anyone. I got this big house. He he said, I don't have any children. There's no family around. So I bought this. And he shows me this receipt. I go, what's this? And he's reading it, and he goes, it's a life alert. A life alert. Oh, I know about those. He goes, would you mind when it comes? I ordered it. When it comes, can you put it up for me? Yeah, not a problem. As far as I know, you just plug it in. (laughs) But you know, at 90 plus, it's hard to do this. I mean, I'm already feeling it in this knee sometimes, and I'm only 60. So he calls me up the next week. Hey, my life alert's in. Can you come? Yeah, I'm coming. I'll bring my table too. I'm going to adjust you. Oh, could I? I'll have lunch for you. Great. I get there. I adjust them. I put the thing up. It works fine. We tested it. I said, I can't stay for lunch. I got to go. I'm in a hurry. I have some other appointments, others to see. He understood. And we said our goodbyes, and I left. Next week, I called. No answer. I called again. No answer. I told my wife, I'm just going to go to his house. I'm just going to, you know, we do this regularly. It's not like I'm intruding. He should be expecting me. Thank God I knocked on the door. He opened the door. Because I thought something else happened. But he opened the door. And I said, I tried reaching you. He said, yeah, I've been having a rough week. But I want you to know something. Come in here, Don. Come in here. And we sit down. He goes, you're not going to believe what happened. You know that life alert you put in? I go, yeah. And, And you know... Right after you left, I made myself lunch. And I choked. And I couldn't breathe. And he was like that. And he couldn't, he didn't know what to do. And you know what he did? He pushed the life over. They were there in two minutes. He's that close to the place. He said, you saved my life. I said, I only did what you asked. Your life is saved because of Jesus Christ. Remember last week when we had that conversation? That's when you were saved. I'm 
going to give a life alert, a call. I don't know where you're at today. I, I know some of us here, we believers, but we've grown lukewarm. We've become comfortable. We've let compromise slip in. I, maybe, maybe that compromise is something you're doing, a sin, and, and you know what to do. You come back and you repent. And, and then you're restored again. But then you sin again. And maybe even the same sin. And ask again. That's what he says. Come back to me. Ask again. And then you sin again. And it's the same sin. And you've done this over and over and over. And you can't seem to break it. I want you to be encouraged. Because he says, 77 times seven. In other words, as much sin as you think you have, I got more grace for you. I got grace upon grace upon grace. But know this, one day, you're not going to desire to do that sin. You will be an overcomer. I guarantee it because it's the Holy Spirit I'm putting in you that will change you. You can't change yourself. Let my Holy Spirit do it. That's how it happens. So don't give up. Don't stop. So you might be lukewarm and you might be questioning who and where you are in Christ, your faith. You don't have to question it. You don't have to question it. You just come to him. He's knocking. You let him in. He's going to take care of the rest. He'll prepare the meal. He'll eat with you. That's what it says. And some of us here maybe have never done this before. And how do I do it, you say? Well, it's the same way. He's knocking. The Bible says that, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That means he doesn't just point the way to the Father. He is the way, the only way to the Father. This is an altar. This is where sacrifices are made. I'm going to open up these altars. We're going to worship. But if you're struggling, if, if you want to receive the Lord, or you need to come back to Him, I want you to come forward. Let me pray. Let us pray for you that you may be strengthened, refreshed, and renewed. This is the time to do it. Because when you leave here, you may not have another opportunity. But you can be guaranteed your place and your position with Jesus. Let's worship. And I will never forget the moment I Like you do. 
right here. This is all the Lord's doing. If this is the first time you've received Jesus Christ into your life, your next step is to be baptized. And we can do that for you here. Once at the end of each month, you can go online and you can schedule that. The rest of us who already are believers that have been renewed and refreshed in the Lord, right? All of us. This is a, a special moment. And so the Bible says, those who hear my words, those who believe in he who sent me have eternal life. That they are no longer judged, but they pass from death to life. That's the promise. And it also says that all, say all, all who hear my name and believe me have the right to be called the children of God. You're a child of the Most High God. There's nothing on earth that heaven can't intervene. That means any struggle you have, you look up and you look out to your family. You reach. We're a family of God and we're here to serve one another. Right? Let's pray. I want to pray us out Let's bow our heads. Father, I, I thank you for this time and this moment. You're so good to us in <laughs> so many ways. We can't even count them. But we are grateful and we are thankful. And as we leave here today, you've impacted us. You've changed us. Help us to continue to do that as we leave here into our homes and into our neighborhoods and into our workplace that our eyes glorify you, that our ears hear things that glorify you, that our mouths speak things that glorify you, that our hands do those things that glorify you, and wherever our feet take us, let it glorify you. We thank you in your mighty, holy, and precious name, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we all say amen. 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 God bless you. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to hit the like button, share, and subscribe. God bless.